What's going on, guys? Welcome to the live stream. Uh, tonight, we're going to go over a bunch of tips um, that has to do with hunting in general. Some are for beginners, some may be for the more advanced, but we're going to have a discussion this afternoon. Hopefully, you guys follow along. All right, guys, hopefully we get some people in here. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the live stream. Um, again, this is going to be the schedule for uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to do this, do these uh, every Tuesday, um, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you guys are new to the channel, um, really appreciate if you guys could subscribe uh subscribe to the channel <clears throat> and um so you guys don't ever miss a video we have a bunch of playlists uh you know through hunting uh food plots um there's a lot of information on there so if you guys want to check out uh all the playlists on the channel uh be sure to do so so um we're gonna wait a couple minutes get some people in here uh get the chat rolling and um we will go ahead and get this started um there was um Somebody commented, uh, I think it was like the last live stream that I did about the lighting that I looked orange. Well, now the lighting should be a little bit better. We have some natural uh, lighting set up, so the lighting for the live stream should be a little bit better um, this afternoon. So again, um, this is going to be the, the routine here every Tuesday night, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then we're going to go ahead and upload our regular videos on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you guys wanna go ahead and get in the chat, what's up, Kyle uh, Hendrickson? Hey Dave, how's it been the past few days? Uh, been good. Uh, weather's been actually uh, good. Um, we had Christmas party over the weekend. Uh, it was almost 60 degrees today. Uh, sunny, weather's been good. We had some snow the past couple days, um, but today was a good day. Um, hopefully, you got, hopefully you guys are doing good. And um, hopefully you guys are doing good. Hope you guys are ready for the holidays coming up. We got Christmas, New Year's. Um, I'm looking forward to a few days off and um, hopefully get, uh, you know, a lot of stuff done on my days off of work. So what's up, Jason? Good evening to you, sir. So also, if you guys are watching, uh, if you could do me a favor and go ahead and share uh, this live stream out to your buddies and uh, get them to uh, join in as well. Uh, what's up, Danny? Uh, what's up, Timothy? Um, you guys are always in here. Appreciate that watching. Uh, hope, hopefully you guys are doing good. Um, yeah, so if you guys could share this live stream. Uh, so tonight, again, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to talk through some tips here. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, some of these tips are pretty, you know, common, but everybody talks about them differently. So I'm just going to give you run through a bunch of tips and give you my opinions on those and then if you guys have questions uh, with each, each tip um, you can go ahead and leave those in the comment and I will be answering uh, your questions in the comments so number one uh, what's up Cecil Tucky Outdoors welcome back uh, so number one is obviously going to be scent control now a lot of people I feel like they take scent control very lightly um, when it comes to hunting, uh, no matter what kind of animal that is. But when it comes to uh, deer hunting, whitetails, whitetails always seem to have that sense. Um, they know when, when something's going, going down, something's not right. They just have that sense. They smell it. They know what's bad about to happen. So with scent control, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I'm just going to hunt the wind. You know, when hunt, hunting the wind is good enough. Um, in my opinion, I don't think so. Obviously, hunting the wind, having hunting, having stands set up for proper wind direction, is very critical if you have them uh, set up properly, which is a very important part of hunting is wind direction. But the other steps, as far as scent prevention, I feel like is left. It's just thought of too lightly. So that's always, you know, 
leaving your clothes in a washing your clothes scent free, you know, leaving them in a container, um, you know, whatever, you, whatever your techniques are, as far as your own personal, uh, scent control, those need to be taken very, very highly, um, and serious because, you know, if you're hunting a stand, okay, and your deer coming out in front of you, your stand set up for just say a north wind, you know, if you're expecting them as deer to come out in front of you. Well, what happens when deer are behind you? Because you can never predict 100% where the deer are going to come from. And wind direction, I don't care what anybody says, it always changes. It always changes. It shifts. Um, you get gusts. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but the past couple of years, uh, I think the weathermen have been uh, not too accurate because they say one wind direction and it's actually going the opposite. So I don't know what's up with that, but wind direction, it always changes. So you have to take the proper steps in your personal self, um, your clothes, you know, your body um, and things like that to make sure that you are scent free as possible. Um, washing your clothes, keeping them in an airtight container, um, you know, and some people don't think about this and it, it, a lot of it comes down to your diet as well. Um, I'm sure you guys have been around people that, that have ate garlic and, you know, spicy food and stuff like that. Well, you know, what we eat when we sweat and stuff, it emits through our body, it emits through our skin and it stinks. It smells, you know, if you're drinking alcohol, um, and all that stuff you know, you're going to smell like that when you go into the woods and the deer aren't used to that, or they take that smell and associate that smell with danger. You know, if they smell that they're gone. So, um, wind direction is very, very critical and your personal hygiene, your clothes, your body and steps like that. So that's, uh, it's very important. And again, you know, this is just things for you know, some people might not care about that. And I understand, you know, some people just, they don't want to get wrapped up into that. They just want to throw some clothes on and go and hunt. And trust me, I know a lot of people do that. They leave their clothes in the garage next to the gas cans, you know, hanging on the four wheeler and they kill a monster buck. It happens. It's luck, but you know, a lot of it's skill as well. But a lot of times it just depends on your deer as well. If those deer associate that smell with danger, they're gone. If they smell that all the time and they don't really have a danger associated with that smell, you might be in the chips. But um, if you're hunting deer, you know, that's not used to human activity, you know, you, you need to watch your, uh, your scent. So uh, what's up, Frank? Uh, seen two very nice bucks this year, but came up empty. Couldn't get them in range. Um, yeah, it happens a lot. Um, I've seen a lot of deer this year, couldn't get them in range. Um, it's the way it goes hunting and, and then, uh, that's what makes it fun. But at least, you know, if, you know, they're in the area and hopefully they stick around and they survive the uh, remaining of the season and you can get them, uh, you can get a chance at them next year. Uh, Gabriel agreed. Awesome. Have you tried scent wafers? Um, I used some scent wafers in the past. Um, the past couple of years, uh, we've been really using uh, nose jammer. Um, I really believe in nose jammer. I had deer um, downwind from me multiple times this year, um, and they didn't they didn't whiff me or didn't you know stomp and and blow out of the area. Um, and I actually had one deer, um, excuse me, that was actually one hundred percent downwind. And I was covered in nose jammer. And when he came in my path, he stopped. He stopped. He was he was smelling. He snorted like one time, and then he relaxed. He calmed down. He didn't. He couldn't smell what it was. He got that nose jammer in his nose, and he just couldn't get out of it. The smell, and he didn't smell me. And he just calmed back down, and he went back to you know what he was doing. Um, but. I really believe uh, in that product. So uh, that's tip number one. Take scent very, very highly. Uh, wash your clothes, hunt the wind. You know, hunt, hunting the wind in majority of the cases is just simply um, not enough. Um, and again, that's for, that's not for everybody. Some people just want to throw their clothes on and go and hunt. And that's perfectly fine as well. I support, uh, I support either way. Um, that you go about doing it. 
but for the people that do take it you know into consideration that's what the tip is for so tip number two tip number two is providing deer with food water water i don't know how you guys say water 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 uh, and shelter food water water and shelter is a given having food on your property spring summer fall and winter is very important if you can provide enough food according to the amount of deer on your property and have that greening growing through the entire year you will have every deer within the area on your property. Food plots, um, you know, enhancing natural browse through fires, um, you know, bush hogging, just keep that fresh growth coming. Um, anything you can do to provide food. I prefer green and growing uh, plants. Um, in the Northeast, we don't have green and growing all season long. Most of our green and growing is done probably around the end of October on as far as natural browse goes. Uh, pretty much everything's gone. Uh, deer d will focus in on uh, woody browse. Um, and that's why I like antler grow is because when you spray it on green and growing plants the, uh, and it gets sucked down into the stems and the, and the plants itself, you know, that's locked in the woody browse. So when deer go, they have no more green to eat, they can eat the woody browse and they're still getting uh, nutrition uh, from that woody browse. So um, food, uh, food plots, if you can focus on uh, natural browse in the spring and summer, uh, enhance that any way you can, antler grow, prescribed fires or something like that, to get the native browse and as much browse as you can in the area and then focus on food plots in the fall and winter you can have a year-round food source on your property and again all the deer that's in that area you're going to have every deer on your property as long as you keep that food there and you're not pressuring the deer and pushing them out of there otherwise they will return but they're gonna be mainly nocturnal on the food source. So you wanna be able to keep that deer in there uh, during daylight hours, which a key to that is having green and growing plants. Um, a lot of us uh, forget from time to time that deer, white-tailed deer, and many other animals are naturally browsing animals. This is what they do on a daily basis. They they go through the woods and they take a bite here, a bite there, a bite there, a bite here, a bite over there, a bite back over the other side as they walk and browse and mill through the area. This is their daily diet is green and growing plants. It's there from nature for them to consume. So the more green and growing plants that we can provide wildlife, it doesn't have, just have to do with deer. Every animal that eats green and growing plants that's what we need to focus on. So creating healthier natural browse and food, food plots, is the key to increasing the nutritional value, the nutritional value of that plant and giving the deer year-round nutrition through green and growing plants. I can't emphasize that enough because a lot of times, again, people will see uh, a television show and they will see somebody some tv celebrity dumping some stuff on the ground and in our heads we see that celebrity doing that and we think that we if we can go out and do that we're going to grow 200 inch deer as well well it doesn't work like that you know it's what we do through green growing plants this is their daily diet through green and growing plants it's what we do year after year is is what you see was when you see the benefits there's nothing in the world that you can dump on the ground or or something like that and you're going to see monster bucks in a year six months 
or something like that. What you do this year will benefit next year. There is no silver bullet in anything. It, it takes time. It's year after year after year after year of nutrition, you know, that you're, you're to trying to provide to the deer. That's where they get bigger um, and, and healthier. And a lot of times people forget as well as that buck comes from that doe. So a lot of people try to feed the bucks and forget about the does. Um, Antler Grow, you know, talks about that all the time. Um, you know, you we need to be given the nutrition to that doe because through her pregnancy and everything, she's going to be producing um, that buck. So the more nutrition that you can give her, the healthier her fawns are going to be. Uh, Sean, I have a question. How would I hunt deer late season? You hunt day, uh, deer late season by hunting a food source, uh, whether that's something that you're throwing out some corn or if you have a green and growing or a green field somewhere, um, your key to success in late season is a food source. Uh, Timothy, we hunt a big farm. They're always spreading cow crap. The deer are used to it. We hung out the barn and then head in the woods. We blend right in. That's that's true. That's what I was kind of just saying. You know, if you know, deer, you have to figure out what's in your area as far as smells and, and things like that. And deer can be accustomed to that smell. And as long as they don't associate um, that smell with uh, uh, danger. Hot Mama Gaming. Sorry, just getting in here. What's up, Dave? What's going on? Uh, hot mama gaming what are your opinion what is your opinions on feeding deer corn are you for it or against it you always hear people saying not to um i don't a hundred i don't have a problem with somebody that feeds deer corn um but you have to remember consider the fact that corn has literally zero nutritional value other than some carbs you know, to help get through the winter and stuff like that. There's carbohydrates, which corn is a macro uh, nutrition. So there's there's no health benefits in feeding deer corn other than some carbs, which isn't going to grow a buck. It's not going to make his antlers bigger. Um, it's going to give him some carbohydrates. But other than that, corn has zero nutritional value. So, and also... I, think, I don't even know what the percentage is now, but over 90%, I want to say, I could be wrong on that number, but over 90% of corn is now GMO corn, genetically modified. So all this corn that we're buying and feeding the deer, this GMO corn, I don't think that it's a good idea. Um, but there are times that I use corn. I'm not 100% against it. There's times where you know I, I sprinkle it out. I don't like dumping it in a, in a pile per se. I like spreading it out a little bit, but um, I'm not against it. Um, and a lot of people will disagree with me. I personally don't think that deer are meant to eat corn because you have to think that deer is a wild animal. Corn is something that's man-made. It's planted. You know what I mean? It's not like a, like a food plot but because it's already a green and growing plant. But as far as corn goes, I just don't think that they're meant to eat it because you see all these studies and stuff and, and, and things that, you know, if you just all of a sudden uh, feed a deer corn, you know, it could possibly die with acidosis. Um, they have to build up enough enzymes and stuff to digest the corn. Um, it's just like a cow. You know, all the meat that you buy from the grocery store um, from a cow uh, a lot of them are corn fed and cows are not designed to eat corn. Their stomach is not designed to eat corn. So if I buy beef, I'm buying grass fed beef because a cow is a naturally grazing animal. They feed on grass. This, you know, we, we get away from that. We, we forget about that a lot of times that wild animals are grazing animals. They feed on grass and, and stuff like that. Um, and they feed them corn because it's cheap. And, they can't provide, you know, a green uh, pasture, you know, year round in the majority in a lot of states. So they feed them with corn. Well, grass fed is 
you know, they may use hay or something that's dried up hay, and they use that to feed to supplement the cows or, or whatever through the winter until they start getting green and growing uh, plants again. But um, that's a good question, Tim uh, Timothy. You know, I, I don't, I'm not against it 100%, but I also don't agree with it 100%. And like I said, I, I still use it from time to time. Um, but personally, I just don't think that deer are uh, are meant to eat corn. Uh, having no luck for bow season, I've only spooked a few with my ATV. Not sure when and where I should be hunting. Post road is definitely on here in Missouri. Any tips? Uh, yeah, just you know, folk. Now is the time of year you just focus in on um on late season. Uh, if you focus in on late or uh, late season food source, if you can focus in on a food source. Um, this time of year, you'll be in the chips. Um, you know, majority of states, there's no green and growing, uh, plants anymore. So if you have that food plot that's green, um, that's where the deer are going to be. If you can, you know, if you're one of the type the people that use corn or something, if you throw corn out, um, you know, and there, there's nothing around for the deer, uh, to eat, they're going to come to that corn. Um, you know, they're going to go where the food source is. Sean, so there are two fields with dirt and stuff, and there's like little grass growing in the field. Is that a good spot to hunt? Any green spot that you can find um, that has something green growing in it, that's where the deer are going to be. Um, if you have a standing, uh, if it gets really, really, really cold, and you have a standing um, bean field, um, the deer will be in that in the bean field on the carbohydrates. Um, They'll be in the grains. Um, what those semi warmer days, if you can have a green, uh, if you can hunt a green food source, you're better off that way. Hunting and stuff with Jan J. Hey Dave, hope all is well. Doing good, man. Hope you're doing. Uh, hope you're doing well. Timothy, 100% agree. We don't use corn much. Just wanted to pin you on that. Yeah, man. Like I said, I'm not 100% against it, um, but I just think of nature, um, and I just don't think deer are meant to eat it. Um, obviously, they will because you know it's something new to them. It's like candy, but um, I just don't think that uh, they're 100% meant to eat it. If that if that makes any sense, if you just think about nature and what uh wild animals do is graze um just think about that for everybody that's listening uh you know we we forget that a lot of times that deer um are grazing they're wild it's a wild animal they graze uh they take a bite here and a bite there hunting stuff with jan jay today was the last day of deer season here in new york Oh, wow. We still got um, 30 days, 35 days left here in Maryland uh, for deer hunting. There's a stand in the middle of the of the two fields. Should I hunt the middle stand? There's a stand in the middle. Of, uh, you should hunt whatever stand that has the correct wind direction uh, for that area. Uh, figure out where the deer are coming from, and then you can focus in on your stand uh, location um, from there. But um, if you have two fields, uh, you can hunt in the middle. I mean, as long as you have you know cover in that area and the white uh, right wind direction, uh, I'm sure it'd be a good spot. Um, you just have to figure out where the deer are actually uh, coming from, what side um, that they're actually coming from. So as far as tip number two goes, we covered water. So now we need to cover or we covered uh, food. So now we need to cover water. Um, Water, a lot of times, is scarce uh, on a lot of properties. Um, you know, a lot of properties don't have streams and ponds and, and stuff like that. But an important key to hunting is having food, water, and cover. Um, we just covered food. But having water, water, water uh, on your property, uh, whether that's putting in little, you know, little ponds or something, digging them up, little plastic ponds you put in there, uh, just to have a, that water source on your property be an incredible uh tip uh to do um thankfully one of the properties uh that i just started well just got permission to hunt in pennsylvania it has a stream that runs through there so 
that's going to be a good uh, water source um, throughout the year. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. But if you can have that water source in your property, um, that's going to be another key to keeping deer um, on there. Uh, Sean, would calling work late season? Uh, probably not that well. I mean, you could call um, some some general calls. I'm not a huge uh, caller. I'm not a professional caller in any sort of way. Um, I will call during the rut. Um, but you have to think as well, you know, a lot of times people will over call and you'll just ed educate the deer. So, and it's another thing, if you call and they associate, they know what's real and what's not majority of the time. So if you're calling and you're calling and calling and calling, um, and they associate that with danger, um, they're not going to come in. So you have to be careful on how many times you actually start calling and uh, and things like that. So we covered the water part, food part. Now, obviously, is shelter. So um, you have to figure out on your property whether how depending on how big it is, whether it's five acres or a thousand acres, uh, you either you're going to have uh, you got to have shelter. So whether that's creating you know, like some uh, sorghum grass, planting it, some switchgrass or something like that to have cover. Or if you're going in the woods, creating like hinge cutting um, and something like that, you got to have cover on your property. So some areas just kind of have that natural, you know, bedding area. Other, er other times, you know, you might have a chunk of woods where it's just open. You know, there's no cover on the property. Well, then you have to create that cover, whether through hinge cutting or putting in like a, some sort of uh, food plot as far as switchgrass or sorghum grass or standing corn or something like that to keep give the deer a secure area where they can go in and uh, feel safe. So that's tip number two, obviously, food, water, and cover. We covered uh, tip one, which was uh, wind direction. Uh, tip three is pressuring deer. Uh, pressuring deer um, is one of them things where a lot of times, you know, we'll walk into the woods not knowing or not caring about wind direction when you're walking in, walking into the woods. Um, it's a very important uh, part of hunting is knowing the wind direction and deciding what areas to enter and exit the uh, your property. Um, a lot of times, majority of the time, in the mornings, deer are going to be on a food source, whether that's an open field or if you're baiting or something, early morning they're going to be on there. So accessing the property through an open field is no good. You have to have a, an uh, access where you can get into that property and not disturb the deer. So generally speaking, from food to shelter, if you can catch the deer coming back to their bedding area from their food in the early morning, but you have to have that access uh, to be able to do that. So whether that's, you know, cutting a road, you know, just getting a chainsaw or, you know, raking the leaves out through the woods or using a leaf blower or something to where you can sneak around that, that food source and not make any noise to be able to access your ground blind or your tree stand or whatever it is that you're hunting out of. Um, but you have to have an access route and an exit route. It's very important. Um, the property that I just got in Pennsylvania, there's a ton of um, old logging roads. So those logging roads, from what I've you know briefly looked at, are going to be good exit, enter and exit routes uh, from my tree stands, whether that's uh, whether I'm hunting over a food plot or deep back into the woods uh, near bedding area or something like that. I'm going to be able to use the access roads to be able to do that and hopefully, you know, not alert the deer according to uh, wind direction. So uh, that's one part of it. And the other part of pressuring deer is obviously hunting the property uh, too much. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're limited to the amount of property that we have to hunt. So um, we tend to over hunt. A property. Um, when we overhunt the property, um, you know, majority of the times you're going to push the deer out, and they're either not going to return, or they're going to return and be 100% nocturnal on your property. 
So you just have to be uh, careful with that uh, as pressure in the deer. And another factor that plays into that is trail cameras. Um, trail cameras have exploded, you know, a lot in the past, like five years, you know, pretty much everybody runs trail cameras now. So we get very excited about checking trail cameras. So, you know, we'll put a trail camera out and then, you know, we, we can't hold off. So in our mind, we're like, oh man, I want to check that trail camera. So I go back, you know, three days or a week or two weeks and you're going in the woods, you're, you're stinking the place up, you know, you're, you're walking in, checking the trail camera, not paying attention to the wind direction. All that stuff matters, guys. Um, all that stuff matters. Personally, uh, when I put trail camera out, I'll check it maybe two weeks or three weeks. Sometimes I'll go in, I won't even check it uh, for like a month if it's earlier in the spring or something. Uh, when it gets closer to deer season, you know, I'll check it maybe a little bit more. Uh, but it always, always pay attention to uh, wind direction when you're checking the trail cameras. You want to stay, you know, the, especially the closer you get to deer season, you want to stay as scent free uh, as possible uh, when you're checking those trail cameras. Uh, don't check them too often. Uh, I think they're a great tool uh, to use, but don't check them too often. Do you save the tarsus glands off the deer you kill to freeze and then use them next year? I don't. Um, I know friends and, and stuff that do uh, and have uh, good success with it. I have thick woods on the property I hunt on. And what time of day would you hunt late season morning or afternoon? Because I've heard and been told different options. Um, it depends on your property setup. Uh, probably the majority of your success is going to be in the afternoon. Um, if you can hunt an afternoon, uh, food source, uh, you're going to have good success with that. Uh, mornings are always tricky because majority of the time we're hunting food sources. So in the mornings, uh, the deer are going to be on the food source. So, uh, it's not going to be a good, you know, uh, thing to access that food source, um, early in the morning. So, a lot of people will tend to hunt afternoons over a food source and they have uh, far better um, success with that. But again, that goes down to your property, how your property is set up, how your property is laid out um, and things like that. So uh, it just really depends uh, on your property. But I'd say 80 percent, 75 percent that you're that you're going to have better success in the afternoon. Uh, over the food source. Keep the question uh, questions coming, guys. So we covered uh, wind direction. We covered uh, food, water, and cover. We covered pressure and deer. I keep hitting this. Um, so next thing we're going to cover is using trail cameras. Now, using trail cameras, like I said, has really exploded. Uh, over the past, I'd say probably over the past five years, they've, they've really exploded. Um, they've been around for, I don't even know, 15 years, 10 years, 12 years, something like that. Um, I've been using them pretty much uh, as far as, as long as I've been deer hunting, uh, 15 years, something like that. Um, I might have started using them a little bit after that, but since they've been out, I've been using trail cameras as far as I can remember. Um, years ago, they were garbage. You know, a lot of them, just a lot of the ones that I've used, you know, a lot of the companies went out of business. You know, they don't make them, they don't make the cameras anymore. Um, I remember back in the day, I bought a camera, uh, actually two of them, they're pretty expensive. And like six months later, I had a, issues with them and then the camera company was out of business. Um, <clears throat> I remember always sending cameras back for repair um and things like that so it got costly but uh trail cameras are a very important uh part of scouting um i think they they come in handy sometimes um i think we sometimes we tend to rely on those a little bit too much because and i'll tell you why in a minute but um if you set trail cameras up in certain areas and use them properly uh, it, it's a great scouting tool. Um, right now, currently, um, I just set some up last weekend or two weekends ago um, out in Pennsylvania, and I have a, a one and a half acre 
uh, field. So I took four spy point cameras and I put one in each corner, each corner up high, about eight feet angled down. And I have those set on time lapse. So every 30 minutes, so every 30 minutes, those cameras are going to be taking pictures every 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, or it's going to, I'm going to let them go for about a month. I'm not going to check them until a month. So time lapse overlooking a field, um, I think is a uh, very, very handy option and tool to utilize is uh, uh, time lapse mode on trail cameras, especially overlooking a field. Now, as long as you don't check them, trail cameras too often, they can be a very, very handy tool. Um, and you don't want to get too close to bedding areas uh, with the trail cameras because the more you go in there, um, the more you're going to just pressure that area. But um, I like to mix it up with videos uh, and pictures and also time lapse. If the trail cameras offer that feature, you know, I'm going to use that feature. It just depends on what area um, that I'm using uh, the trail cameras, whether that's on a field, a travel corridor between bedding and feeding, or now very popular over the past, I'd say three years, is cellular uh, trail cameras. Sometimes you can go into a bedding area, put a cellular camera, and you don't have to touch it. You know, it's going to send you pictures uh, to your phone, so you won't you won't have to go into that bedding area unless you need to uh, change the batteries. So, uh, trail cameras have really really exploded over the past five years. And if you have a far away property, if you're into cellular cameras, I believe those are a very handy uh, very handy to use um, on properties where. Um, say, say you have a property that's three hours away. Okay. Well, consider the amount of gas, um, that it takes you to travel those three hours to your hunting property. Um, add that up every single time you're going to check trail cameras. Well, cellular cameras are just going to send you the picture. They're going to send them to you over your, to your phone. You don't have to drive back and forth, you know, waste gas money. So overall you will save money, uh, and not have to go to your property and pressure the deer to re retrieve the pictures because they're just going to be sent to your cell phone. So all these tools over the years, you know, just depending if you're into that sort of thing can be very uh, handy um, depending on, you know, how you're using it and uh, things like that. Do you plan to sell any woo merchandise, hats, t-shirts, etc.? Uh, 1972 David. I do. Um, I had a major issue with my website um, this year. Um, it had so many glitches and I had a store set up on it and it just, honestly, it just fell through. Um, I'm pretty much a one man show. So I just had so much stuff going on and the web, it was costly to do the website and all this other stuff. But for 2018, probably around like March, uh, the new website will be up and running. Um, there will be merchandise on there. There will be uh, T-shirts. There will be hoodies. There will be hats. Uh, there will be some decals. Um, and there will be also links on there to some of the products that we use and things if you want to you know, go on there and check out. But as far as Woo merchandise, there will be some on there in 2018. Uh, hunting and stuff with J&J &J. trail cameras are a great tool for hunting as long as hunters can show respect and leave them where they see them. That's a very uh, good point there. Um, I've had many trail cameras stolen, um, but one trick that I've learned is to mount those high in the air, you know, eight feet, 10 feet up in the air and then angle them down. Um, because, you know, if a trespasser is walking through the woods, majority of the time they're not going to have a ladder with them or something where they can just pop it up and steal your camera. And it's also going to be above head height. So, you know, person walking through the woods, they're not going to be, you know, a lot of times they're not naturally going to be looking up, you know, for a trail camera. So you can get away with that um, a lot of times. Put them high, like Dave just said, yes, it's a pain to bring a ladder along but it's better than having to buy a new cam when someone swipes them from you. Absolutely, Timothy. Uh, mount them high. You know, take a, I, I take a little, uh, your ladder sticks, I take a little four foot section uh, ladder stick 
I'll strap that to the tree. I'll take my safety harness in. I'll climb up to the very top of that, and I'll I'll screw it into the tree and just angle it down. Um, that's it's a good tool. It's a good tool to to use. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a good option. Uh, you'll have far less trail cameras uh, stolen if you start doing that. Joey Hall, I'm sorry if I'm repeating any questions. I also have a couple acres to hunt and no real way of keeping deer in the property or even crossing through. How can I change that? Uh, Joey Hall, basically, uh, if you're having a hard time keeping deer on the property, uh, Joey, how big, how many acres is your property? Um, oh, okay. It's a couple acres. So a couple acres, you're going to have a hard time no matter what um keeping deer on there just because it's so small but if the if that woods is connected to other woods that's going to help but the key to that is being that it's a small property is to stay off of that property as much as possible and don't bump the deer out of there so if you're constantly pressuring the deer off you know a couple acres they're just not going to come back those couple acres they're going to avoid that area. They're going to travel, you know, the north side, the south side, east side, west side. They're just going to avoid that area completely. So if you can stay out of there, out of that woods and create some sort of food source on that property or even create a bedding area or something like that. But if you can better off creating a food source, um, depending on how many acres that is connected to, but if you can have a legit food source, um, on that property, um, that's going to be your ticket um, to keeping deer on there and having them purposely, you know, uh, pull them off their path that they're that they're typically traveling on. You're going to pull them off the path and have them come into your property um, to get something to eat. So they're not nece they're not going to live there. They're not going to hang out a lot of times. But if you that's all you need them to do is you need them to come off their typical path of travel and have them sneak into your property, take a couple bites and then go about their way. And hopefully you're there uh, when they come in uh, for something to eat. Have you ever seen a buck that didn't rut? Um, I've heard of it. Um, they don't have a whole lot of information on that, but I've definitely uh, heard of that happening um, before. Um, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of information uh, on that but um it does happen i know uh for sure so uh we covered wind direction food water and cover pressuring deer using trail cameras to help you scout for deer next step is have this tip is going to sound a little weird as far as deer hunting success but have realistic goals and having realistic goals is a, a lot of times it can stress us out so if you're stressed a lot of times we're not going to think clearly and we're going to make bad decisions so dig into that a little bit deeper of having realistic goals is um i talk about this all the time is uh television shows you watch television show shows and you see all these tv celebrity hunters you know knocking down 200 inch deer it stresses you out. It's like, how the hell is this guy doing that? You know, all consistently, all the time. I need to be able to do that, or I should be able to do that. And we just we go nuts. It stresses us out, um, and it makes us do crazy things. So it may even cause you to stress so much to where you you try to do something illegally. But the fact is. Every state, every county is going to have a different quality of deer. Um, Midwest, you know, Iowa, Kentucky, Ohio, I mean, sure, killing 160, 170 inch deer, you know, it's, it's uh, you're pretty, pretty likely that you're going to see one or you're going to kill one that big in the Midwest. Um, when you start coming down south, not so much. Northeast, no ant you know, very minimal antler restriction, um, you know, and, and nobody really manages, you know, in the Northeast, 
um, it's very, very difficult to find a mature deer. So you have to scope out your property that you have permission to hunt and have realistic goals. So in your area, you know, you, your, your mature buck in that area might only be 120 inches. Well, if he's 120 inches, well, guess what? He's not going to grow to 180 inch deer. You know, you just have to have realistic goals. Now, there are things with food and, and, and stuff that you can help, you know, make that deer or let that deer show his full potential by give him, giving him the nutrition um, that he requires uh, to reach a bigger deer. So if you can take, you know, if you have a property, okay, um, and over the course of just say four, three, four, five years, if you provide those deer with quality nutrition and the average is 120 inches, sure, you can take that area to 140 inches or 145 inches, you know, over the course of several several years, 150 inches. You just have to have realistic goals um, when it comes to, you know, big, big bucks and, and the deer in your area. Now, there are parts of Maryland where you can walk into the woods and there's a browse on. You know, as far as deer can reach, from there all the way down to the ground, there's no there's no food. The deer have their ribs are showing. They look skinny. They're unhealthy. Um, they're because there's so many deer. Um, an average uh, square mile can roughly handle about 30 deer uh, per square mile, which is should be providing enough you know quality food. Uh, to make those deer, you know, survive and, and, and be healthy. Um, majority of places in Maryland, I mean, some areas have 50 deer, 60 deer, 70 deer. There's some areas that have a hundred deer per square mile and there's no food. So, um, you have to take that all into consideration, um, as far as, you know, goals go with whatever it is that you're trying to do on your property, managing it, you know, helping, you know, produce bigger bucks. Um, there's no substitute for age. Um, if you want deer to get bigger, um, obviously you have to give them birthdays. Um, you have to let them live. You have to let them pass, um, and let them grow and live their life and let them mature. Um, just like human beings, you know, as we get older, we get bigger, we mature. Um, and that's what deer need to do as well. Now through our diet, providing ourselves with proper nutrition and things, pro, higher protein and stuff like that, we're going to be able to reach our full potential um, just like deer can. So if we can provide deer with a 365-day uh, uh, nutrition, then that deer is going to reach his full potential. So you just have to have realistic uh, goals. Uh, John, it's easier for them because they buy they buy deer. Um, some do. Um, there are some some good uh, television shows left out there, um, but majority of them, you know, you don't know where they're hunting. You know, they have a they have a TV show to produce. Um, they're trying to kill the biggest uh, the biggest buck there is. There's nothing wrong with that, but um, I think it set a lot of people up for failure. Honestly. Um, because it just gives us a false mindset on what we should be able to kill. Um, you know, there's, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but you just have, like I said, you just have to have, uh, realistic goals. Uh, what's a good first time food plot with hand tools? Um, if you can get an area, um, and clear it down to bare dirt, whether that's, you know, getting a wee whacker or something and, and burning, burning the grass and everything down to dirt or spraying some uh, weed killer um, to kill everything. Uh, honestly, you can, you can, you, you can uh, plant some oats uh, like buck forage oats. I found this year buck forage oats will pretty much grow anywhere. If you can uh, broadcast, broadcast them out and they can hit the dirt, uh, they're going to sprout. So buck forage oats, uh, some winter wheat, um, you can even do some like brassicas or even clover, honestly. Um, 
but all those are good food plots, uh, you know, with hand tools, you know, clover will grow as long as it gets enough sunlight. Uh, your main thing there is just making sure you have uh, a good pH, uh, get a soil sample, don't skimp out on a soil sample, um, and you should have uh, some good uh, success with that. So um, anybody have, have any questions as far as what we covered so far? Um, again, if you guys are new in here, uh, make sure you subscribe. And uh, if you can give this video a share, um, that would be awesome. I love hanging out with you guys, man. Going live, talking to you guys, interacting with you. Um, it's great, and the time just, just flies by. Um, we're already like 50 minutes into the live stream, so it's uh, it's cool, man. I, I, really, I really enjoy it, um, hanging out with you guys, and I appreciate you guys uh, watching and uh, following along. So, what we got? Anybody have any questions? GA Hunter, welcome back to the live stream, man. I'm running late, but I'm here now. No worries, man. You're here. Uh, join in on the fun. Uh, Kyle Hendrickson, hey, Dave, I did manage to send you a message on Facebook. I sent it from my wife's account. Uh, Kyle, I did get your message. Um, I just didn't get a chance to respond yet, but I did get your message. Um, I will respond to you uh, probably after the uh, live stream is over. All right, so tip number six, we covered wind direction, scent control. We covered food, water, and cover. We covered uh, pressuring deer, using trail cameras, um, having realistic goals. So tip number six is uh, having the proper equipment. So having the proper equipment, whether that's a tree stand, a bow, your gun, your rifle, your muzzle loader, making sure everything's sighted in, your scope, making sure your bow sighted in, shooting your bow as much as possible before the season and even during the season having tree stands that you take your time to set up and you're not in the tree and the, and the stands leaning to one side and you're up there, you're uncomfortable because if your stands uncomfortable, you're not going to be able to sit there for long periods of time. So having the proper equipment, uh, is going to help you sit in your stand longer to have a better chance to kill a deer. Um, like I said, if that stands leaning to one side, you're going to be in the stand leaning and you're going to be uncomfortable. I've been there before. I've hung, I've hung stands that's crooked and you know, you're up in the stand. You're like, why the heck did I not fix this? You get, you, sometimes you just get lazy and you don't want to fix it, but trust me, taking the time and going back and making sure that stand is hundred percent straight, not leaning too far forward, not leaning too far back. It's going to allow you to sit there longer um, and give you a better chance of, uh, of killing a deer or whatever it is that you're hunting uh, making sure your bow has a good string on it the string's not frayed um, having a good peep sight a good D loop um, I've had uh, not me personally but I've seen where the D loop gets old gets frayed and it breaks off you go to pull your bow back it, it pulls out so your string gets frayed um, I've also seen people that are bow hunting I've been in deer camp um and people you know everybody you know this one question always pops up is when you're in there um people say oh what kind of broadhead are you shooting or what kind of area are you shooting or you know this that and the other well you start talking about broadheads and i've literally seen this before is people will pull their broadhead out okay and the blades on it will be bent they'll have they'll have mud in them or dirt in them they're duller they won't cut freaking butter and and they're hunting with these broadheads. And I've had people, I know people that shot uh, their broadheads through like plywood and all this other stuff. They pull them out and they put them right back in the quiver and they go to hunt with them. Like, are you serious right now? You're really going to hunt with that broadhead. And I've literally seen this. So don't make those, don't do that pretty much. Don't do that. Don't shoot your broadhead in the dirt and throw a piece of plywood 
pull it out and put it back in your quiver and go hunt with it. You need to make sure your broadhead is as straight as possible, it's not bent, and as sharp as possible. Um, you owe it to the, the animal and you owe it to yourself to make sure you're trying to kill the deer as, uh, as quick as possible. I sent mine Saturday after, hey, and I got I got yours as well, buddy. I got your uh, your message as well. I just got some three blade swackers. Can't wait to whack a doe with them. Uh, awesome, man. I've shot swackers for I think like six or seven years now. Um, I love swacker broadheads. Uh, it's a great great broadhead to uh, to use. Um, two blades is what I've uh, shot. So back to having the proper equipment. We talked about your bow, making sure your broadheads are in. Um, they do make, a lot of people don't know this, but they make an arrow spinner. And it's just a little, uh, like it's, got, it's like a little two wheels on it. You put your arrow in there and you spin your arrow. Well, anytime you spin that arrow, um, it's gonna show you if that arrow is bent, if you have knock wobble, if your broadhead is wobbling or bent, it's gonna show you on that arrow spinner. Um, I think they're only like 12 bucks or something on Amazon. If you guys can get an arrow spinner, it's gonna, you'll be surprised at how many of your arrows are broadheads or uh, knock wobble uh, that you have. And a lot of times you'll be shooting your bow and you've, you, your bow's been paper tuned and all this other stuff, but you're still having these weird issues a lot of times it comes down to your actual arrow or it could be in the knock or your broadhead is bent and you're sitting there fighting it and fighting it and fighting it when it just boils down to uh, spinning your arrow. Uh, Rapid Bass Basin TV. Where would you go hunting right now if you don't have any food plots for the late season uh if you're in a state where you can bait then you could you could definitely bait them um but deer they are they will eat woody browse so if you don't have anything green and growing on your property um if deer are still traveling through there um then you need to figure out where they're traveling through um and they will eat woody browse so if you don't really have you know a you know main food source then you need to just hunt your standard travel corridors. I don't know how big your, your property is, but you need to, if they're passing, if they're coming off another property, passing through your property to somewhere else to a food source, then you need to catch them in the middle of there. Um, but if you're into baiting, then you could, you know, you could bait them. Um, you could put something out to, uh, to bring them in. But uh, if you don't have nothing, you know, like that, then you're going to have to just hunt your standard travel corridors and hopefully, you know, they're coming from somewhere else and you can catch them uh, passing uh, through you to get to where they're going. Uh, Cheddar B, welcome to the live stream. Hey, Dave, when is the best time to hunt? Before, during, or after a snowstorm? Um, honestly, I've never really had a whole lot of luck during a snowstorm. Um, I would say probably before or um, after. You can have success during, but you got to think during that during that food source as a wild animal, they're going to want to feed. So if you can hunt a food source before a storm comes in, a lot of times you'll have success with that. You can definitely have success during because you got to think deer have to eat three, four, five, six times a day. So a little bit of snow or something like that's not gonna stop them from feeding. They they have to eat. So after the snowstorm, when that food, when that everything's, you know, grass and everything's covered, you know, if you have, if you still have that area or you know where that area is where they're feeding, you know, after that snowstorm, they're gonna be coming there trying to eat. So you can really have success in all three situations, but, um, I would probably prefer before the storm. I can honestly say uh, during rain. Now, if you have a rainstorm coming in, um, there's so many articles that are written about this, and I had a personal experience with it myself. But if you can hunt during a light rain, a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of big bucks have been killed during rainstorm. Just a light drizzle. 
a light rain. I killed my biggest buck during a light drizzle. Uh, it was 172 inches. Uh, it was right in the rain. Rain will not stop deer from moving. Um, and again, they have to eat two, three, four, five times a day, six times a day. They, ha they, they have to eat. So a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow is not going to stop them uh, from eating. Now, if we're talking, you know, <clears throat> like a monsoon, you know, 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds, <clears throat> thundering and lightning, then guess what? That deer is not going to be moving. He's going to be hungered down you know, bedding down somewhere, trying to get, you know, trying to get out of it. But those, those light precipitation, you know, a light rain, some light snow or something can be a great time. Um, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to stop them. They, they have to eat, they have to drink water. Um, so it's not going to stop them. Hunting with Preston. What's up, buddy? Hunting stuff with J&J. &J, what do you prefer, fixed blade or mechanical? Uh, hunting stuff with J and J. I prefer a mechanical broadhead, and I'm gonna I'll explain why. Um, back in the day, years ago, when when bows uh, first came out, um, I could be wrong with this. I could be wrong, but when bows first came, or when I first got into bow hunting, I shouldn't say when bows come out because I wasn't even born yet. But um, when I first started bow hunting. Um, bows were pretty slow. They were, they didn't, they weren't, you know, 300 feet per second like they are, you know, these days. So bows were fairly, you know, they were fast back in the time, but now you look back on it, they're slow. I used to shoot uh, three blade muzzy uh, broadheads and they would shoot perfectly fine. I would have my bows paper tuned. Um, you know, I'd shoot muzzies and they would shoot perfectly fine. Over the years, bows started getting faster and next thing you know the mechanic uh fixed blade broadheads weren't shooting straight anymore because it's more makes it more harder for that arrow with the with the fixed blade to travel straight when you have a faster bow um there are ways to tune that broadhead you know there's so many uh options and variables in there but if you can, a lot of people will take their broadhead and they'll line it up with the vein. Um, some people will tell you yes to do that. Some people will tell you no. But I think it just boils down to your setup and what works with your your bow and your arrow um, and broadhead setup and your obviously your fletchings and um, stuff like that. Um, so that's why I kind of got away from it, just because it was too much. It was too much to mess with. You know what I mean? I don't have time, and I'm just not. I just don't want to do all that stuff. So I went to mechanical. I started out shooting, uh, I think it was a, a split fire, I believe, uh, mechanical. I started shooting that. Obviously, they shoot just like field tips. So I started shooting the split fires. Um, and then I think I shot uh, Rage, and then I landed on the Swacker. Um, I fell in love with the two-blade Swacker. Um, in my opinion, a Swacker... Broadhead cannot fail. Um, there's no way for it to fail. So um, that's what I was left with um, was mechanical uh, Swacker two blade. Um, I've shot them for I think like seven years now. Um, they shoot straight. They shoot just like your field tip. Uh, there's no tuning required per se. Um, you screw them on there. You know I spin them. Make sure they're make sure they're straight, um, and you're good to go. Now I will say I have no affiliation with Swacker, but I can say when I first started shooting them seven years ago or so, maybe even longer, if you would spin that broadhead on an arrow spinner, that broadhead you would see do that. It was the machining of the broadhead was very poor um, back then um, as far as being straight. You you'd spin them and they would they would wobble. Over the years, I, I check them constantly. And they don't do that anymore. So the machining of that broadhead has become uh, better um, over the years, and they do not wobble um, anymore like they used to. Awesome, guys. Well, we're into an hour here. So uh, live stream. I'm going to go ahead and end this live stream. So uh, we're, again, we're going to be streaming for one hour um, every Tuesday night. Um, 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, each day 
each you know time we live stream we're going to be talking about a different topic um so next week we'll be talking about something else so hopefully you guys found this video helpful in any sort of way hopefully it helped you um you know if it did please give the video a thumbs up subscribe please share the video i appreciate you guys following along um if you guys ever have any questions i'm always always an open book you guys can send me messages on facebook if you don't follow us on there uh whitetail obsession outdoors you can follow us right there on facebook send me messages i try to respond to everybody uh recently it's been uh, a little slow responding just with the holidays and, and stuff like that but i'm an open book you guys can send me messages ask me questions um opinions you know i always try to give you the honest you know best answer uh there is and uh and things like that and uh i will see you guys back here next tuesday night 7 p.m eastern time thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you guys next time